<laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm joined today by Senior Security PM Sarah Leon, and we're going to talk about the whole implementation of Azure Sentinel on a hybrid implementation. Sarah, is Azure Sentinel only a cloud-based solution that can protect your cloud implementations? Or is there a story or something that we can share that can protect your on-premises implementation as well? Oh, definitely. Um, the whole thing with a seam, I'm going to say seam. Um, uh, you might know, depending on where you are in the world, you might know it as a SIM. Um, it's S-I-E-M, so Security Information and Event Management System, That, um, which is what Azure Sentinel is. It's it's really important that um, a, a SIEM looks at both looks at your entire environment. So whether um, that's uh, on-prem or cloud or both in a hybrid implementation, which is what most people have these days. It's really important that a SIEM can look at both of those environments because attackers aren't just going to look at your cloud environment. They're not just going to look at on-prem. Um, you know, they're going to traverse through different things. And so that's why your SIEM needs to be able to ingest events and logs from everywhere in order to be able to get security uh, uh, so to get security telemetry and potentially find attackers. So no, definitely it's not just for cloud. It runs in the cloud and we use the uh, a lot of inbuilt cloud features to allow the service to scale, but it's certainly not just for monitoring cloud and not just for monitoring Azure. Wouldn't be a very good seam if that's the only thing it did. And that's just it, right? The whole aspect of attackers trying to get access to your information as a new currency, and especially because we're all working from home the situation is, is elevated in regards to the attacks that occur because more data is traveling in more places. And so a lot of organizations having that on-premises imp implementation, you know, they worry, do they need like a security solution just for their on-premises implementation and then one for the cloud, meaning that I have multiple control vectors for my security piece or something like Sentinel, something that's decentralized that I can go to the one portal and have an understanding in regards to what attacks are occurring and what I can do to automate the, to address those attacks. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really difficult for organizations nowadays is that our um, environments are getting more and more complicated. So um, you'll have some on-prem infrastructure. I mean, even Microsoft still has a bit of on-prem infrastructure. Um, that's normal. Uh, you'll have some on-prem infrastructure. You've probably got something in the cloud. It may even be that you have something in other clouds as well. So you might have multiple clouds plus your on-premise, and you need to be able to monitor all of these uh, from a security perspective and operational as well, uh, because if you don't, you don't have visibility of what's going on in your environment. But um, it, I mean, even before cloud happened, it was still tricky to get appropriate monitoring and logging just across on-prem. So nowadays when we've got the cloud and on-prem in hybrid environments, it's even harder and it's, it's definitely complicated, which is why you need to look at products that have that capability to look at everything. And as you said, to be able to centralize all that data because the reality is you can't log into, uh, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, even in double figures, number of portals to try and work out what's going on in your environment. It's too time consuming, it's too siloed. You know, we need, you need to be able to have like a central place to be able to look at what's happening in your environment because there's just no way that any one person or even a big team of people can efficiently run things uh, without a centralized store. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You need you need one place to go. And when hackers are chasing after your data, I don't think they're, you know, it matters to them if it's on-premise or in cloud, they're gonna chase it throughout your architecture regardless. And so mm -hmm. having a solution like Sentinel has that ability to be that overseer of your entire architecture and not worry if it's on-premise or in cloud because it manages throughout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as you said, I have a sticker uh, on the back of my laptop, which I can't hold up that says that's out of scope, said no attacker ever. And, uh, you know, it's totally true that 
Um, an attacker doesn't care where your data is. They're just going to go after whatever's valuable to them uh, and whatever they can either resell or they can use. I mean, different attackers have different motivations. And so, yeah, they don't care where it is um, and they will just go looking for it and they will take what they can find. So certainly um, there's no point just monitoring cloud and saying, oh, we'll forget about on-premise and, you know, vice versa. It, it's, yeah, attackers go where the value is. And uh, for most organizations, the reality is they will probably have valuable um, assets and data on-premise and in the cloud. And attackers will will just move around as they need to in your environment. So yeah, you've got to, you've got to look at all of those things. It's, it's really important. So let's kick off with the first demo. And there's, you know, numerous demos you want to show us. What's the first demo we're going to go through? Okay, so, oh, so many things to go through, but I'll start with, uh, I'm going to start talking about data connectors because a seam uh, doesn't do anything until it has data in it. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, you can see at the moment in the top there, I have 74 uh, connectors. Um, if you've been following Sentinel since it went GA about 18 months ago, uh, you will know that we have a heck of a lot more connectors than we used to, and we're adding them all the time. Uh, we do have... Uh, we call, of course, have cloud ones, as you would expect. We've got a lot of Microsoft products like Azure AD. Uh, we have Azure Firewall. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to call them all out. Security Center. We've got a lot of third-party products. So if you're using like Barracudas, Checkpoints. Um, and uh, as I said, I'll just scroll down slowly so people can read. Uh, if you're using Microsoft 365 Defender, Cloud App Security, Office 365. Um, now, that's looking at the cloud side of things. But of of course, um, as, as we've just talked about a lot, there's uh, you know there's a lot of telemetry that we can bring from on-premise as well. Um, because there's 74 connectors here, I don't have time to go through them all. Um, otherwise, we'd be here all day, and I think people would be quite bored. But I did want to highlight a couple of important ones here. Um, so the first one that I wanted to uh, talk about, and they kind of go together, is the common event format. One. Um, so common event format or CEF, um, C -E -F, is um, uses the um, log analytics agent, which is something we use in other, um, other environments as well. Um, and it's an agent that you can install either um, on Linux or Windows. And what it will do is um, it will collect syslog, uh, common event format, and syslog messages if it's Linux. Um, and it also does something with Windows events, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but if you've got a device that outputs in Ceph, which uh, many firewalls do, many third-party products do, you can send that into Sentinel using this collector. Um, so you essentially can make a collector um, a centralized collector, and you can send that to Sentinel. Now, you can either make that collector um, on-premise and send it up to Sentinel, or you can create a virtual machine scale set and you can uh, actually have that centralized connector and it can scale in and scale out as required. We actually have a template for that um, in our Sentinel GitHub repo, which I'll talk loads about later. Um, and we can put a, a link to that as well. So um, it's actually already been configured. Uh, we've actually already built it a template for it for you to use. So that's a great way to collect things um, uh, both syslog and uh, uh, any device that it outputs in uh, Ceph. Now, I did want to talk about, um, I'm talking about Ceph and syslog together, and there's a reason for that, which is um, Ceph is actually just a more formatted version of syslog. So, of course, syslog, as we know, that's where you get a lot of things in Linux. So, if you've got a lot of Linux machines in your estate on-prem, you can bring them in using, uh, you install the log analytics agent, and then you can um, either have a central collector or each individual machine can send thing syslog up into Sentinel. Now, again, it's, uh, generally we find that most customers will create a central collector uh, and then send that up to Sentinel, but it, we can accept it individually as well. So um, that's the first side of things, the Linux side. So the other thing that you can use the log analytics agent for is to take security events from Windows machines. Now, um, we use the Windows version of the same log analytics agent to do that. Um, as you can see, uh, we've actually got, um, you can install the agent here. Um, uh, we have a different, uh, 
obviously slightly different installs for things that are um, in Azure and things that are not in Azure, but basically we can collect security events. Now, um, how it works at the moment is you can actually, uh, within Sentinel, you can actually select which events to stream. So you can see we've got four different levels per se here, uh, all events, which as you can see is everything Windows security and app locker common is a standard set of events for auditing purposes. Uh, we, there is a list um, on our Microsoft documents that shows you uh, which event IDs are actually collected in common uh, and minimal is just the very bare minimum that you that might be of note from a security perspective. And then there's none. Now, one would assume if you're looking at installing these, you probably don't want to use none, but uh, definitely look at the other three. The reason that we give you different options um, is, of course, because um, when you send events up to Sentinel um, and log analytics, you are paying for the ingestion. So you may, although a lot of people will automatically jump to all events and say, I want to put every single event in here, that might actually not be the smartest thing to do because, uh, you know, you always need to think when you're doing security logging, um, because you pay for what you ingest, you need to think, if I'm ingesting this and paying money, um, is it worthwhile? Am I getting a useful detection from it? So, and each business is going to have different ideas about whether it's worth it or not, uh, whether a particular log is worth ingesting or not. But do be careful, don't necessarily go straight to all events because you can end up with very, very noisy, <laughs> very, very noisy logs and ingesting a lot of data. And if you're not getting some in interesting security detections from it, it's probably worthwhile thinking if that's actually worthwhile ingesting. Usually what I abide by in those scenarios is whatever the organization that you support has agreed to uh, based on the business rules for that organization, they will, you know, they'll be okay with if you've asked, if they've asked for full documentation or full analysis of the inputs that are coming through to analyze all, then you're allowed to analyze all. Don't do it on your own make sure that you have the buy-in from the organization that you support. And if there isn't that need, uh, possibly there is because of ISO standards or specific verticals like mm -hmm. finance and healthcare, there might be that requirement. Uh, but if there isn't that requirement and there isn't a standard to ad adhere to and your organization is okay with not capturing everything, put the rules in place that, it, that agree with what your organization is trying to accomplish. Definitely. And something, again, a, a traditionally on, on premise seems they did work in a different way. What you would have is you would build a, a, a number of virtual machines and you would buy licenses for those virtual, uh, well, they wouldn't need to be virtual machines, but Typically, they would be. You would buy licenses for your SIEM and all the machines that were part of your SIEM infrastructure on premise. And then it wouldn't be on how much data you ingested. It would just be on the, the literally the processing capacity of the machines that you bought, which means you could traditionally what people did was they would throw as many logs as they could at their on-premise seam because that's how you got value for money is that from uh, what you paid for the license. Now, um, that's the traditional way of doing it. Now, of course, as seams have moved into cloud, they've gone to this ingestion-based charge. So there is also a bit of a strategic mindset shift here that you need to be aware of that it's not necessarily, it, it's not cost effective anymore just to collect all the things for the sake of it. So what we do find is a lot of customers making that transition, uh, they do have to have a bit of an evaluation because it might be that they've literally never evaluated it before because it was just, oh, we just send everything to our seam. Whereas now, of course, um, there uh, it, it makes sense to be more efficient about that. So good, it brings up a good question. If I do send all my data up to my up to the scene, does that provide latency in terms of a response or a detection? No. So the good thing, I mean, if you did want to send all the things to Sentinel, that is absolutely fine. I mean, Sentinel sits on top of Log Analytics, which is part of the wider Azure Monitor platform. It's our entire monitoring platform for Azure. It will scale as required. And uh, unless I believe uh, that we have tested it to something insane like 10 petabytes of data. Wow. Um, so if someone, if anyone out there can send more than 10 petabytes of data at Sentinel, then that would be an interesting thing to look at. But, you know, realistically, um, 
every any organization even you know our big large global customers wouldn't be able to send enough data up to sentinel to get it to slow down uh, what is worth mentioning there though uh, because that's a very good point is if you were collecting uh, events from uh, syslog and windows events because we have uh, our intermediary the uh, the uh, machine that's got the running the agent, you would need to scale that appropriately. And that's what I was referring to talking about uh, what's in our GitHub repo. Uh, we do have some virtual machine scale set template templates that we've already made. Um, and if you're not familiar with a virtual machine scale set, what that is, is a way that um, you set some, uh, you can set some uh, thresholds. And if say the processing gets to, um, or the IO gets to 80, percent then uh azure will automatically uh build another machine and scale out you can also scale up scaling up isn't great i'm not a big fan always scale out um, and by scaling out we mean adding more machines scaling up is when you increase the power to a single machine but in order to do that you have to reboot things so that will provide a service interruption so we prefer scaling out so um for these two that i've just talked about which are more aimed at on-premise you do need to think about how you size uh the number of collectors depending on how many events you expect to send up to sentinel but um when it actually hits the 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 actual sentinel system the the platform it, it's not a problem from there so you're right there are a couple of considerations to take in there but um not with the actual processing power of the seam itself now from the github repo for the templates themselves anybody can go in and, and extrapolate that and use it for their own purposes have you seen the reverse in terms of you know organizations contributing to the repo and, and providing their own spin on templates specific to possible verticals like healthcare and what have you? Um, we're getting there. So I have the, uh, I have the um, honor slash um, very, very busy job. Um, I'm one of the people who reviews some of the submissions we get into our GitHub repo. Uh, we, there is quite a big team that do that because you can imagine we get a lot of submissions. Um, so um, we get submissions from our customers, from our partners, and also from internal Microsoft resources as well, who um, who've been doing work. So um, we do get some of customers sharing things back with us. Of course, it does depend on what it is. Sometimes customers have written proprietary things that they're not able to share, which we completely understand. But uh, we do get uh, people sharing their workbooks, their playbooks, detection rules. Um, I had um, a partner, uh, I know they shared um, a very cool little um, way, um, or it was um, a cool little script and a template um, that were just uh, made uh, security events sending more efficient. There's, and, and we really encourage you, um, if it's something you're able to share with the community, please submit it to our GitHub repo. Uh, we do review everything and we'll give you feedback um we are quite busy so um, we're trying to get faster so do apologize if you don't hear from us for a bit but we are trying to go through them because you know the fact is that when we're talking about security and i was told this in an old job and i uh, by a manager of mine and i think it's a really nice i think it's a really nice way of looking at security um in the in security, we're, we're all in this together. We're not rivals. Um, we're not rivals. We're not competitors. You know, everybody who runs computer systems needs to keep them secure. Now, uh, and and we can really benefit from knowledge sharing with each other. Um, and even companies that are, you know, in the same industri industri industry, so um, whether it's finance or, or um if it's retail or whatever it is, they may be competitors on a commercial level, but when it's uh, security, um, you know, they actually face similar threats and often it's really helpful to share that knowledge. Um, now, of course, as I was saying, there will sometimes be proprietary things that can't be shared outside, but um, I think sharing knowledge um, as best we can is one of the best things that we can do um, as a security community and an industry because we all face similar threats uh, and we have similar issues so the more collateral we can share the better so yeah if you're out there and you're listening and you've done you've written a cool hunting query you've done some cool automation if it's something that you don't need to keep internal we really really encourage you to submit it to the repo uh, for, you can now get 
uh, which is very exciting. You can get some badges. Uh, and we did do last year, and I believe we're going to do it again later on this year, is we did do an Azure Sentinel hackathon. And that was judged by some of our top security VPs, uh, like Ann Johnson. And uh, the winners actually got cash prizes and some other cool things. So, you know, it's definitely worth doing. Like, go do it. I can't, I'll stop talking about it because I, I love people to submit to the repo. And we're always happy even if it's your first time, we've got loads of guidance on how to do it. Um, you you know that if you submit something to the repo, it's being reviewed by uh, an engineer, and we can help you if, uh, if if there are just some mistakes or it doesn't fit with our templates. Like we'll tell you and help you. So don't be scared to submit. We we really appreciate your submissions. And that's the important piece, right? It, it's not only your creativity from the outside coming in in terms of what you're sharing with us at Microsoft. It's where is the mindset going in terms of security? What are you know the things that people are thinking about that provides us a better idea in terms of, well, what services do we need to address? How can we make Sentinel that much better to achieve what organizations are trying to accomplish? Definitely. And yeah, we do look at things submitted to the repo for ideas for, um, you know, new things that the product needs. Um, and also we do have the Sentinel user voice. That's uh, something that we have for most Microsoft products where you can submit ideas. Um, you can also upvote ideas that have already been submitted. So if you've never looked at the Sentinel user voice, go and look at that. Uh, add your votes to anything you'd like to see. And if you can't find um, the thing you want on there, feel free to add it as a new idea. That's something we really uh, appreciate too. We do look at it and uh, we do submit those ideas from user voice uh, to the Sentinel product group, who are the engineering team who decide on you know, the new things we're going to develop and uh, the new things we're going to put on the product. And, and we're always listening to customers because of course, you know, if it doesn't do what our customers need it to do, then no one's going to use it. So, you know, that's really important for us. So let's move on to the next demo. So what are you going to show us next? Oh, so I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, I realize we've just gone on a, a tangent there, but I'm going to show you something that uh, is just worth mentioning because it does confuse a couple, it does sometimes confuse some folks. Um, and it's worth mentioning for that reason. Now, I talked before about uh, I talked before about the uh, the log analytics agent and having and having um, security events and syslog uh, already going into uh, going into your log analytics workspace where Sentinel can see it. It's worth mentioning that if you already have a log analytics workspace, you may already have this configured. So I'm going to start again, uh, just by showing you something that is worth mentioning here because sometimes it does confuse people. We have here log analytics. So log analytics is what sits underneath Sentinel. And it's just worth mentioning that if you are already using log analytics, you may already be collecting uh, Windows event logs and security logs and syslog because that's not a feature specific to Sentinel. So it's worth looking if you're putting Sentinel on top of an existing log analytics workspace, you may already find here um, that we're already collecting those things. So you can see here, for example, I've got syslog uh, coming in already. Um, you can actually be quite granular in what you choose that the agent will send to you. If you're already doing it here, and then you've got Sentinel on top, you don't need to configure this in Sentinel. Um, this is specifically for Windows events and uh, for syslog. Um, it is, I realize there's a bit of an overlap there, but it's just worth mentioning. So um, if you're not starting from scratch, just have a look and see if your log someone has already configured it in your log analytics workspace because they might have done. And so the connectors, in, and it's already feeding the information into Sentinel, you're capturing that information. What is the next steps in terms of analytics? What is the next steps in terms of reporting that you would want to look at? Yes. Yeah, so next step is we would look, if we were wanting to get this going as quickly as possible, which is what I assume most people would, um, we would go and have a look at analytics. Now we have, uh, we have loads of out of the box rules. And if you're new to Sentinel, this is always where I would recommend you start. Uh, we uh, and we're adding to them all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, it's always worth having a look to see if we've got any new ones. So you can see here, um, we've got in use, 
um, and uh, marks on the ones that are already turned on. But what I would do is um, have a look at these rules. So for example, I'm going to look at this um, uh, I'm going to look at user login from different countries. Uh, now you can see here the data source is Okta. Um, this is actually preview, so it's quite new. Um, in here it tells you data source, um, Okta single sign-on. Now because it's gray here, it says that um, we don't have this data source coming in. And I know in this uh, uh, demo I'm using here, we don't have Okta. So that's going to appear as gray. So there's probably no point turning that on. We won't stop you from turning on a rule template where the data source isn't ac uh, actually coming into Sentinel, but you can do if you want to. Um, so instead, um, let's have a look at this uh, first access credential added to an application or a service principle when no credential was present. So, of course, this is an identity one. So we're looking at Azure AD. And you can see in order to uh, uh, have this rule working properly, we need Azure AD audit logs. Now, um, you can see it's green. So we have Azure AD audit logs going into this uh, going into this workspace, which means we can turn the rule on. So um, what you would do, um, I realize this rule is already turned on, but let's go with it. You would click Create Rule. And then you, everything here is fully customizable. So if you don't like the name of it, you can change it. You can change the description. Uh, we also map these uh, rules to the MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework. So there are quite a few. Uh, there are quite a few different tactics. Uh, it's something that a lot um, of SOCs are using or trying to adopt. Um, so we have put this one under credential access, which makes sense. But if you disagreed and wanted to change it, um, arguably, maybe you could put this one also under privilege escalation, potentially. Uh, we won't go there. Um, and. And then we can also change the severity here as well, which I think for most people, when you're just turning on the templates for the first time, is most likely to be the thing you might change. Because um, we've considered at Microsoft when we've been writing this template that it's going to be high. Uh, this is a high severity incident if this rule is triggered. But you might not think it's high. You might want to change it to medium or low. And again, um, this depends on your organization's, um, your organization's security policies, um, risk tolerance, et cetera. So um, you can change that. Uh, in the next tab, we've got the set the rule logic. So you can see here, this is actually the rule logic. So this is written in KQL. Um, if you KQL is Kusto query language. Um, we have a lot of different tutorials on KQL that are free. Um, there's a great plural site course. You may have already used KQL in uh, Defender for Endpoint, we use it there. It's used in Log Analytics, um, Azure Data Explorer. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is a really nice query language that's pretty easy to pick up, quite high level, but also really flexible. Um, I'm not in in this uh, particular video. We don't have time to go into the uh, right. nitty gritty of KQL, but hey, if there's if there's a uh, an ask for it, we're definitely we would create that video later on down the road if that's something sure. that you and reach out to us and let us know uh, and yeah. we'll set up more time with Sarah and get that done. Yeah, we love a bit of KQL. I do KQL tutorials reasonably regularly. Um, and uh, yeah, we're definitely keen to do that. Um, and again, there's a lot of material online that Microsoft provides for free as well to digest in your own time, but we can do videos as well. Um, we map entities here. Now, entities are sometimes, entities are important because they help us match more things together. Um, so an entity, as you can see there, we've got five entities, account, host, IP, URL and file hash. Now, the reason entities are important is because we start to see patterns with entities. Because uh, if you have a host, um, if you see a host coming up in a number of different uh, different alerts, that suggests m maybe that there's something bad going particularly bad going on with that host. It helps us join together a lot of what's going on. Now, for some of these queries, it will already be defined. Um, but if it's not defined, you can actually choose one of the columns from the logs to say, OK, this is where the host is. Now, you don't have to define all of them. It's not 
necessary. And in these rule templates, we've done it for you, but that's just if you're writing your own. Um, coming down to the next bit, we have query scheduling. Now in Sentinel, uh, we do uh, we run our rules on a fixed time period. Um, the most frequently you can run them is every minute. Uh, you can't do them any quicker than that. Uh, and we, we can't fix a set time. I get asked about this a lot by customers. And the reason for that, there's not a particular reason for that, but to be honest with you, when we're doing things and saying, run this rule every hour, run this rule every day, run this rule every six hours, or run this rule every five minutes, it's not really necessary to to say, please run this at a fixed time, because that's quite static. And you know, an attacker, for example, if an attacker knows you run a rule at midnight every day, um, and maybe they'll do all their attacking and dodgy things up to 11.59 p.m. And, and this sounds crazy, but things like this happen. It's much better to run them on a frequent basis rather than run things on a specific time. Um, and then uh, we have event grouping. Now, event grouping is re is uh, something that's very flexible. Um, what it says is uh, you can. Uh, it basically means an event is something that will, is of note, but it doesn't mean we want to necessarily trigger an alert and create an incident. So um, what we can do is if this if this triggers, we can make one alert, or we can um, and group the events together. Otherwise, we can trigger an alert for each event. So uh, different, this is very, very business. Writing rules can be tricky because this is very, very contextual depending on the organization. Right. Some organizations might want an alert every single time something's triggered. Some businesses will want to group them together and say for the last hour, just group them all as one. Again, that's so, so, so dependent on the organization and the industry and their environment. Um, and that's one of the things that's super interesting about Seam, but also makes it really kind of tricky because it's very difficult to do a one size fits all. So um, of course, with these templates, it, this is a good way to start and you can just tweak them rather than having to go from scratch. Uh, then we go even further than that saying, you can also group the alerts that have been created. You can uh, group them uh, if all the entities match, you can group them um, if, uh, like if only certain entities match, so you can put all the alerts into one incident, if the account matches or if the IP matches, there's tons of different things here. I could talk about this for a long time. Um, if you're familiar with, um, seam, uh, you, this won't, uh, come as anything new to you. If you're brand new to doing security operations, you'll kind of get a feel for it. Um, it don't feel bad if you have to tweak these rules quite a lot, at, uh, at the beginning, that's what most seems you have to do. Um, and to be honest with you, it's an ongoing effort for all organizations because your environment isn't static. Things change. You may need to tweak these. The great thing about Sentinel is because we've got these built-in templates and rules um, and we have a nice UI, it can be very easy to tweak them rather than having to run your own analytics to work out whether your rule is working or not. The other thing to remember that you had brought up earlier is don't do it on your own. Make sure that you have the business decision maker at your organization in lockstep with your efforts in deploying a mm -hmm. uh, because you want to make sure that the business is bought in in terms of the efforts that you're putting forth for the, for the reporting and detection of what's important to your organization. You know, gone are the days where the traditional IT pro was the gatekeeper and all the rules were abided by what the IT pro had put forth in this new age of information and information being the new currency that hackers want to gain, gain access to. It's very important to have the business decision makers involvement and investment uh, in terms of what's actually being detected, how it's being detected, and what's of importance to the, to the organization to keep safe. Mm, definitely. Um, and that, that leads on to something that I will talk about in a second. Um, automated response. Uh, now, I managed to pick one that doesn't have playbooks in here. Well done. But this is where we would add a playbook um, and add our automation, which I will talk about later. But for example, automation is where we would add like sending an email, posting in Teams. Um, we can also do remediation. So we would tag that there. And then when we're finished, 
we can review and create this rule. Now, I think it's going to, uh, yes, it's gonna, val it's gonna fail this validation. Um, I knew that it was gonna do that, but obviously um, the idea is that you would validate it like we do with other Azure resources, and then you could click create. So there's a big bit of work to do here. Uh, when uh, There's a fair bit of work to do here, but much less than a traditional scene when you write from scratch in going through these rules and looking to see what is relevant. Um, in particular, um, I will show you, we can filter here on the data sources to make it a bit easier. So um, of course I was talking quite a lot about um, security events and syslog and Ceph that would often come from on-premise. So if I just filter on those and I didn't do that properly, <laughs> um, then uh, we can have a look at the rules that use those data sources. So if I do that, properly. We can see here, there's a lot, we've still got like quite a significant number of rules here that are using those data sources. So um, for example, here we can see uh, PowerShell Empire commandlets. Um, that is not something you want to see in your Windows security events. Um, and so you can see what's relevant to turn on um, and then this will generate incidents. So here we've got a, an incident. Now this one's very busy. I've picked a very, very busy one here. Uh, but this, as you can see, is a multi-stage incident. And uh, I'm not, this is the investigation graph. Now um, this shows all the different alerts that have been generated. Now I realize you probably can't read them. Don't worry too much because I'm gonna show you them down the side here in the timeline and all the different entities that are involved. So we have some PCs, some users, but we've got a timeline here so we can see the first thing that happened was a suspected credential theft activity. Now, if I click on that alert, it'll tell me more about that. Now, that came from Microsoft Defender ATP. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that product, uh, Defender ATP, it has just been given a new name. Um, we did rename a lot of things uh, at Ignite. Um, that is our um, that is our product that does security for on-premise Active Directory. So this is coming from on-prem, uh, and we can see here that um, the program exhibits um, suspect characteristics associated with credential theft. So that looks like potentially uh, something has happened there. Um, so um, if we go back to the timeline, we can then see uh, we've got another alert here. The next thing that's happened is a malicious credential theft tool um, has been executed. If I click on that, again, it's come from ATP. Um, and this looks like uh, if we scroll down, so someone's used a credential theft uh, tool. It doesn't say which one it is there, but of course, credential theft tool, uh, you don't have to be a security expert to know that's not a good thing. Uh, and then we're going to uh, suspected golden ticket usage. Now, golden ticket is uh, an on-prem AD um, attack. It's attack against Kerberos, uh, which is an authentication uh, method use an on-premise AD. It's not used in the cloud. So you can see that we've uh, got an attack here against Kerberos that's been detected um, and it, it's used to access six different resources. So if we actually uh, hover over that, we can see those six different resources there. Um, there's a number of PCs and some accounts involved. Um, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but you can see um, there's some more suspected golden ticket usage. Then we've got local admin use using um, .NET commands. Again, that suggests that uh, it may be that a user has been compromised, uh, that's got admin access, and they're creating a new account to do nefarious things with. Because what lots of attackers will do is create new, brand new accounts, do all their bad things, delete that account, and then it's kind of covered up their activity. So uh, we do, that's uh, a fairly typical attack pattern. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of things going here. Uh, we've had remote code execution, enumeration of SMB. Um, so again, this is a lot of, uh, this is um, this is mostly an on-prem attack from what we can see here so far. This is mostly an attack that's happened on-premise, but we're looking at it in the cloud using various different sources. So um, it's a great example of uh, a hybrid scenario, and we can dig into this investigation 
investigation graph more to understand what's happening. Uh, we can start digging into these. If I zoom in a little bit, we can start to see all these different entities. We've got the PCs, we've got the, the hashes, we've got, ah, you see good old Mimikatz there. That's the credential theft tool being used. Um, so we can start to dig into this by clicking on the uh, related entities. So a um, SOC analyst can really quickly start to understand and piece together what's happening without jumping between loads of different portals, which is good because with incident response, whether it's security or otherwise, we know that the first thing you need to do is establish what's happening and the bounds of what's happening so you can contain it and stop it going any further. So that's investigation. Um, I know this is a very, very busy one to look at, but I think it's a good one. As you can see, if I zoom out, that investigation graph gets really big. Um, of course, this is going to change every time you do an investigation and um, what you see here and the sources. But I think um, this is a great illustration of what you can do with Sentinel uh, to do your investigations. Now we've gone through data ingestion. We've gone through uh, reporting. We've talked about uh, investigations now. The next step I would think would be what is the response? What is, you know, now that we've detected an attack is occurring, we've done the, the investigation in terms of how the attack is occurring. What is the next step that Azure Sentinel provides that now addresses this attack? Yeah, so there's a couple of things here. Uh, mostly, I'm going to talk about uh, Logic Apps and automation. Now, Logic Apps is uh, the way that we do automation throughout the whole of uh, Azure. It's not a Sentinel specific thing, but we do use it in Sentinel and we use it for three main things. Uh, one is alerting. One is remediation, so actually automatically remediating things, and one is enrichment. So um, there's, and there are different use cases for different things, but typically every single customer really should be, as a, as a starting point, you should be using the automation to do alerting. So um, if you're not familiar with Logic Apps, it's a really nice way to do automation very simply. Um, it has a nice GUI interface like you can see here. Um, you don't have to know any code. For those of you who are interested in the background, it is running JSON. So um, we're going to use Logic Apps. If you haven't seen Logic Apps before, it's the way we do automation across the whole of Azure. It provides a really nice GUI interface to write uh, automation. In the back end, it is JSON. Um, you can look at that in the code view. I personally am not the best coder in the world. I'd much rather just use the, uh, the interface here. Um, so what we can do is we can say, when a response to an Azure Sentinel alert is triggered, um, what do we want to do? So uh, we've added a box here that says, get the incident details uh, from the alert. So we're grabbing here the subscription. We're grabbing uh, the details. So we have to take the, the subscription ID, the resource group, the workspace ID, and the system alert ID. Now, the reason that we're taking these, um, and we have to take these every time we generate an alert, is so we can pass them into another place um, another program. Uh, we might be passing it to an API. But what we're doing here is we're adding it to Teams. So we're saying, uh, if an alert is triggered, uh, take all the details of that alert and send them to Teams. So um, you connect to Teams. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, and then you pick the Teams tenant, the channel you want it to go in. And then you can post a message. Now, you can see here, the message can be dynamic content. So we take the alert severity, the title, the status, et cetera, um, and basically, we would post that, for example, in your SOC Teams channel and say, hey, you know, this is a this is an alert. We need to, uh, here's an alert that's been raised. Someone needs to look at it. We can also send emails. Uh, you can raise tickets. So if you've got a ticketing system uh, like ServiceNow or Jira, something like that, you can do exactly the same thing. You can automatically create a ticket. You can assign it to different people depending on the, uh, the department you work for because sometimes in some organizations, different tickets will go to different departments. There's a ton of things you can do here. And that's kind of your basic alerting, setting up the incident. The so next thing you might... Oops, so sorry. No. <laughs> that, that's huge because a lot of the questions that we get about Sentinel is, does it always provide that automated response in terms of now addressing that issue? Um, can it do the notification? Because I have a trouble ticket system in place that I have to adhere to because of my requirements of my vertical. 
and I can't have that automated response in place. So Sentinel is not, is not for me or my organization because I, under my understanding, that's what it does. It does the automated response. What you're telling us here is from this you know, logic app, I can pretty much put my business rules in play. I don't have to have a coding background to do so. And I can make it so that it's a notification or set up of a trouble ticket for follow-up or you know something that's based on the business rules that my organization abides by as opposed to, no, no, this is just gonna address the issue and, and walk away. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, to be honest with you, most organizations I would not expect to just, I'm gonna fix it and walk away because there's no, you can't report on that. And and you need to you need to operationally understand what's happening in your business from a security perspective. In an ideal world, yeah, we'd automate, and, and we should automate away as many things as we can. But the nature of security operations and the variety of things you see means that we will never be able to automate everything. There will always be a proportion of tickets and issues that have to be looked at by a person. The idea with automation is that we automate away the routine things where we know how we want to respond um, and where um, there's a lot of manual process and just very repetitive actions and anyone who's worked in a SOC will know that there are a lot of repetitive actions that often have to be taken. Now the idea with automation is we automate those away to leave SOC analysts to work on the really interesting juicy things that have never been seen before and that's exactly what we do internally within Microsoft soft as well we we try and um we try and clear away um and automate away um nine out of ten um alerts and incidents before they get to a real person um it's tricky to do it takes a lot of, it's tricky um i'm not gonna lie like it does require upfront work because of course you have to think if we see this in if we see this situation how do we want to respond to it then you need to build some automation and realistically for most organizations it's a journey you um a lot of customers i've worked with might just start off with this basic alerting you know raising a ticket posting in teams letting everyone know what's happening and then further down the line they might say hey we keep seeing this incident and we do exactly the same thing every time can we work some automation into that so it is a journey definitely but certainly uh, uh, if you need to raise tickets in your ticketing system uh, for operational reporting etc sentinel can definitely fit into um, whatever your operational procedures are and um, although sentinel does have its own incidents handling uh, pages where you can write comments and do your own incident and write things in there. You know, a lot of customers, because it aligns with their wider operational procedures, choose to use a third party ticketing system. And I would definitely say there is nothing wrong with that at yeah. all. If that's what you need to do, you do it. And that's been one of the biggest changes, right? In the fact that Microsoft is working with third party software because mm. there's a requirement if you're in healthcare and you're finance, retail, whatever that may be there's a current course of action that, that takes place and you know you have to continue on using that those applications it's amazing that you know partnering with those third parties to have this rules in place and automation of a lot of the tasks that would be mundane or you know tedious before can now be quickened in terms of the process of something as simple as creating a, a trouble ticket number Exactly, because you know, realistically, and I have seen this in my career, it used to be that the scene would generate an alert and someone would have to go into whatever ticketing system they use and manually like copy and paste things over, which is just a waste of a SOC analyst time. It's not a constructive use of their time, really. And so it's cool that we can get rid of that. And um, so, yeah, um, that's th there's so many things we can do with automation. Um, you know, um, you've probably seen, and I've talked about many times before, we can do things like, uh, call virus total and look and see if the IP or the hash um, is in virus total. If you're not familiar with virus total, it is a third party system uh, that has a store of things that uh, have been identified as malicious um, because that might help you decide the urgency of an incident. Uh, you might um, want to uh, you know, block a user in Azure AD 
and, and NAD. So for example, the incident that we just looked at previously, um, where there had been some, it uh, looks like some accounts have been compromised, it might be that we say, okay, let's take that entity, let's block it. Now, it might be you don't want to block it, you might force them to change their password or ask them to reauthenticate with MFA. Um, again, these, uh, what, what precisely you want to do, and I think this is one of the trickiest things, aside from writing rules and your thresholds, is how you want to respond to an incident. Because again, that's going to really depend on the business. Um, some businesses might have a very low tolerance for uh, you know, have, might have a really, really low tolerance for accounts being compromised. So they might want to block anything that looks suspicious. But on the flip side of that, if you run automation where you're just blocking users all the time, it's going to, um, if there's a false, if it's a false positive and, you know, we have to, you know, realistically, uh, you, you will always have it, whilst we're always trying to bring them down as much as we can, there's always going to be some false positives. Um, you don't want to block somebody uh, and, and block their account when actually there's nothing wrong. Um, and it might increase calls to your service desk to unblock people. So, you know, there's a huge balancing act there. And I mean, that's security generally, right? Um, you've got to balance security with the business running smoothly. And, and that's a line that's very difficult to tread. Uh, you know, and it always will be, I think, but you know, we have to keep trying. Now from a business rules perspective, what was interesting, you talked about the whole aspect of Azure AD uh, and if a, an account has been compromised, so that individual would be put through, okay, now you have to change your password because we did detect this. So Sarah, you shared the scenario about Azure AD and when a, a password has been compromised for a user, they had their user, that user changed that password. What about in an instance where it's Active Directory and it's an on-premises implementation? That's a really good question and a very good one to ask. Now, it's going to depend on how your Azure AD and on-premise AD is set up. If your Azure AD is synchronizing with your on-premise AD um, and Azure AD is the boss of all of that, then all we need to do is actually issue the commands to Azure AD and it would take care of it on-premise as well. Um, if you're not syncing them, then that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit different. Um, um, so this is why we do recommend, it is Microsoft best practice, that you sync your Azure AD, your on-premise AD, and you have Azure AD as the sort of master source. And also, this is controversial and we probably don't want to go here. Um, we also recommend that you do actually store all your password hashes. You don't just synchronize the user accounts. You also synchronize the hashes of your on-prem passwords in the cloud. Uh, that is Microsoft best practice. Uh, some people uh, as I said, we won't go there because it, that can go into a heck of a debate. Um, some people feel very strongly about that. But um, just so you know, we don't store the actual password. We store sort of a hash, a th a, something that's been hashed and salted about a thousand times. There are many, many advantages to doing that. Um, it helps us be able to uh, uh, use our threat intelligence on your on-premise AD passwords. So um, if you're not doing that, um, and some com uh, some organizations um, and some uh, individuals I know feel very strongly about this because I've talked to people, um, do go back and have a look and consider doing it, there's a ton of benefits, but that's probably a different session <laughs> that we could go into that one. So we've gone through the full scenario, data ingestion, we've gone through reporting, we've gone through uh, event uh, investigation, we've gone through in terms of response. We, this covers everything from an on-premises implementation to cloud and a hybrid scenario with both, scenarios, both instances connected into the one architecture. If somebody wants to start down their journey of now doing the investigation of Azure Sentinel for their hybrid implementation, what would be the best first steps? So I think the best thing, um, there's a couple of things. We have a heap of learning resources. Uh, we have uh, very recently, and uh, well, when we're recording this in the past month, we've released uh, Microsoft Learn, MS Learn modules that you can go um, and work through to get familiar with Sentinel. We have uh, the 
uh, Azure Sentinel Ninja training. I've mentioned this before, but um, one of our amazing program managers in Israel um, took uh, the downtime over Christmas and New Year to update it for 2021 because we've got so many more things in there. So um, that is, oh, I mean, it's probably 20 odd plus hours of material um, about how to set up Sentinel, um, how to set up the connectors, uh, um, how to set up particularly the log analytics uh, agents that I talked about for taking things from on-prem. Um, there's so much stuff in there and it has been very recently updated with all the new features in Sentinel, which we haven't even managed to talk about all of those because I talk too much and there's way too much in Sentinel to talk about, um, but it's all in there. Um, also keep an eye, um, we've got the Azure Sentinel GitHub. Of course, I've already talked about that, but um, even if you don't feel like you're ready to contribute, we have loads and loads of templates and things uh, where you can just deploy it in to your subscription. So if you see something that either we have created or somebody else has, and you think it would be useful for your organization, most things will have an ARM template, which means you just click deploy to Azure and it will go off um, and push it into your environment. You may need to configure some variables, but you get the idea. So um, there's, yeah, the, we've got the Microsoft security community uh, where we do regularly, we do webinars, uh, the program managers and engineering for Sentinel. We talk about new features, but we may just do a focus session on something in particular um, that's sort of a hot topic in Sentinel. Uh, I'm going to be doing one uh, later on this week about uh, monitoring monitoring Azure Sentinel itself, for how you audit what people do in Sentinel. Um, we save them all onto YouTube so you can go back through the back catalog and see what's there. Um, we've definitely got some things on running it in a hybrid environment. And yeah, they're probably the, the main ones I would start with, but there's so much out there. So uh, definitely have a look. If you can't find something or you have specific questions, um, uh, you can find me on Twitter. I do reply to people um, and uh, we're, we're always happy to help. Um, Sentinel's a really cool thing. It's still very new as uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So we know lots of people have questions. So uh, we're really keen to hear your questions, help you out get, and get you started with it. So you know, just reach out. Um, but there is quite a lot of stuff out there and we'll have all the links uh, to that as well um, accompanying this video. So uh, yeah, be, good place to start. Link, the links themselves will be included on the video uh, <laughs> as well as there'll be an accompanying blog post that this video will be embedded into. Uh, so if you're watching this video on YouTube or on any, any other platform, Channel 9, what have you, we will also share the link below uh, that is the corresponding blog post that will have all the links as well as replicating all the steps that Sarah had gone through in terms of the demos themselves. Sarah, so awesome to have you on uh, to run through this because I, I love your passion for security and your passion for enabling those uh, to be more secure, to help their organizations be more secure. Uh, if, again, one more time, if they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you uh, on social media? Yeah, you can get hold of me. I am at underscore Sarah Yo, Sarah Y O. Um, I've got a far, I've got a far too common name to be able to just have at Sarah or at Sarah Young. Um, but yeah, you can get hold of me um, on my Twitter handle. I do uh, check my DMs; they actually are open. Um, so um, you know, do reach out to me. Um, there's the Microsoft Tech Community where uh, myself and my engineering colleagues we answer questions as well, and. Uh, yeah, um, please have a go with Sentinel. Um, I'm a big believer. My um, main belief in life, uh, not just with Sentinel, and life, maybe just security, is that security doesn't have to be hard. Um, security should be easy. Um, it is a lot of common sense. Of course, there are many things um, in, in real life, in business world, uh, you know, there are competing pressures, etc., that don't make it that straightforward and black and white, but certainly here at Microsoft, we're trying to make that stuff as easy as we can um, and make uh, good security straightforward. So um, yeah, have a go at Sentinel um, and see how you go because uh, it's uh, definitely um, a great thing and it's changing a lot. We're getting so many new features so quickly. It's even hard for me to keep up and it's my job. So yeah, go, go out there and, and have a go. Now, if you have any additional questions, we have a Discord server that's set up specifically for this session, uh, for session Ops 103. And if you want to get a hold of me for some reason, you can get a hold of me on Twitter uh, at Wireless Life. Sarah, thank you very much for your time. And everybody, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks. Bye.